Hi there everyone, welcome back to the Royal Society. I'm here with Laura and today we're going to talk about a very famous physicist and radio astronomer, Bernard Lovell. And luckily for us, yeah. he liked keeping diaries. He did. So these are his diaries covering the World War II period. He was taking his scientific expertise and he was kind of using it to further the war effort. He also was contributing to his diaries all sorts of interesting bits of information, including very accurate timings as to what time he woke up and went to bed each day. It's important. All the films he was watching and the books he was reading during this particular period in 1937. We've got Peter Pan. Bit of Hitchcock, T.S. Eliot, all the classics there. It's a bit of a sci-fi fan as well, so lots of H.G. Wells. He's a bit more highbrow than me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see a lot of Dan Brown Da Vinci Code in there. <laughs> The other thing that Bernard Lovell is very famous for is overseeing the construction of and then being the first director of the Jodrell Bank Observatory up near Manchester. This is a famous radio telescope, very familiar to people around the world, but it had a very difficult birth. Yeah, while Lovell was working away at the war effort, he was doing all kinds of experiments with developing radar, spotted what looked like weird shadows on the radar, kind of filed that away. After the war finished, he went back to Manchester and tried to investigate more, find out what these shadows were that were showing up on radar. So to find that out, he needed a telescope. He needed a great big telescope. Yeah. This was many, many years of difficulty and stress, but because he was such a diary keeper, yeah. we can find out what was going through his head at the time. Yeah, so we've got this as the first kind of volume in the series. It's really a diary of the project. Kind of takes you right from the birth of the project all the way through to completion. But he does put like his personal touch into it, oh, doesn't yeah, he? How yeah. he feels and... Yeah, that's right. So he was writing kind of handwritten notes, would have passed it all over to his secretary, who would have typed it all up. So this was the initial plan. This is 1952 and we've got things like contracts, how the driving system's going to work, the control system, the mesh, which was originally going to be how the, yeah, the telescope so worked. mesh dome. Control buildings, diesel generators. Mm -hmm. so we've got pages and pages yeah. of writing. So we're here in early 1953 now. How are things going at this yeah. stage? So we're about a year into the project and we're starting to see some problems. We're getting words like alarmed and trouble. We've got some large figures here. This is going to cost £25,000. Yeah. So budgets are starting to run away from yeah, them a little bit. So. This is hundreds and hundreds of pages. <laughs> so a few years in, time's going by. So here we have an entry. It's been handwritten in this yeah. case. Christmas Eve 1954. And we're going to find that Christmas Eve becomes a theme through these diaries yeah, later on. It does, yeah. he, he always writes quite poignant entries yeah. on Christmas Eve about the state of play. He does mention sort of financial anxiety yeah. and problems like that, but he ends quite positively. He's looking ahead to 1955 and thinks perhaps everything's going to be in place yeah. and funded and done in 1955. Yeah, quite the optimist, yeah. Okay. But now we're in April 1955 and I'm afraid he's in another funk. What does he say here? The gap in the diary is due to the Easter holidays, during which I've been trying to restore myself from the depression and anxiety caused by the troubles over the telescope and with husband. Husband being Charles' husband, who yeah. is an engineer working on the project. That's right. But actually, it's not long after this, on this page here, July, that this is the last typed entry. It sounds like things again aren't going well. Trouble is descending on all sides yeah. again. There was also shocking disclosures in the local paper last week on what Hargreaves is supposed to have said to me in my office. And here we've got Lovell saying he wrote violent objections. And basically, this is the last typed entry. Yeah. At this point, Lovell stops having any kind of assistant type things up. I think we can only assume he decides to go strictly to handwritten notes, which he keeps confidentially because he doesn't want this information getting leaked. Well, let's see what goes on to happen next. Here we have people, the confidential continuation. Spoiler, this has a happy ending. It does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, we, so it must be great to be able to go through and find out yeah. what was going through his head at the time. Yeah, the real story of the whole project kind of from start to end is all in this diary. There is one unfortunate thing about this. Lovell, while being a fantastic scientist, didn't have fantastic handwriting. No. So anyway, we're in 1955 and we can see all these handwritten notes. It's like a table plan. Look how thorough he is, people. <laughs> Even when he has a meeting with the vice chancellor of his university, he shows us where everyone was sitting. <laughs> well, here we go, Laura. We have another Christmas yeah. Eve entry. Yeah. This, is, this is a great tradition. reflect. I think I'll let you do the honours. Oh, thanks. Too kind. <laughs> oh, dear. Another Christmas without the telescope, but surely not next year. Surely not next year. Still optimistic. The site is littered with hundreds of tons of steel. Still, we have a good deal more than a year ago, including the control building, although the control room is still empty. Overall, again, optim optimistic. Yeah. Another yeah. Christmas Eve entry from Lovell. We're here at Christmas Eve 1956 now. 
<laughs> How does it start? Yet another Christmas without the telescope. <laughs> I feel for him. Yeah. But to repeat last year's remark, surely this really is the last. <laughs> surely this really is the last. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So about a month later here, we're in February, and on February 1st, we have a rather negative entry. He's talking about the mess that the finances are in. Yeah. But then, a few days later... He says, well, I suppose yesterday, which was a Sunday, was a kind of red letter day. A red letter day? Yeah. This is good news. Why is this? The telescope was moved. The telescope yeah. moved, but then he does follow that by saying only an inch. Only an inch. That's all right. That is some progress. Yeah. All right. <laughs> now we're into August 1957, and August has mixed mm. news. August 2nd, we got our first reading. So this is really positive news for the telescope. It's yeah. very close to being fully operational. But the next entry in mid-August, you can see things are really starting to go a bit pear-shaped yeah. amongst sort of the administrators and the people involved. There had been a big kind of public uh, committee report into what had gone wrong with the funding of this proje project because they were using public money. It was kind of a misuse of funds in a way because the, the budget had gone so far over. Lovell gets grilled by a committee for hours and the report finally comes out in 1957. He refers to it here as the dreaded report. Yeah. Came out last Thursday. Yeah. And husband, the engineer, apparently has phoned Lovell and asked Lovell to write a letter to the Times newspaper yeah. denying some allegations. Yeah. Otherwise, he will sue me personally. Yeah. So the report came out and kind of claimed that husband basically was completely to blame for all the changes that had happened to the telescope over the five years. So he kind of feels a bit hard done by him. He wants Bernard Lovell to kind of come out and say that he's not at fault. We also see things about threats and information is going to be dragged out of him in the witness box. Yeah. Things are actually finally starting to work with the telescope. It's all kind of coming together. Technically, it's all kind of starting to work, but behind the scenes, it's. It's a hell of a mess, really. The irony of this situation is quite unbelievable, he mm. writes. This is October the 2nd, 1957, and this is the last entry that Lovell will write for a while, which is quite funny because it's two days before George Banks' most famous moment. Two days after this was written, the Russians launched Sputnik, the first artificial satellite. <laughs> Yes, signals from the Russian satellite, the Red Moon, the news of whose launching burst on the world like a bolt from the blue. George Blank played a crucial role. It was the only instrument that was capable of detecting the rocket that had launched the satellite. It was a really big deal. But we haven't really got much of an entry about that, because no. as I said, October 2nd... I guess he was busy. Yeah, I guess that's probably <laughs> it. I, I guess, guess so. probably after that he was too busy to keep yeah. a diary. And the next entry isn't until January the 1st, 1958. We didn't even get a Christmas Eve entry, oh. I'm afraid. So we've got two days after the last entry on October the 4th, the Russians launched their first Earth satellite. All life changed immediately, and the history of those days are in the newspapers. And basically, I think a lot of the mess surrounding Jodrell Bank kind of disappeared quite yeah. quickly after that. Right. Because Jodrell Bank was now so important and played such a crucial role as the space race was starting that mm -hmm. all this he said, he said, arguing, was no longer particularly relevant. What's this been like going through these documents for you? I really feel for him, actually, because he is clearly under a lot of pressure. The financial burden of this project was weighing on him pretty heavily, I think, for the whole kind of five years before the scientific success, which came eventually. He was probably worried he might even end up in jail yeah, at some point. Yeah, I think that was a definite risk at some point. And in the end, he ends up a winner. He ends up being a hero. Yeah. And that gets two pages. Yeah. <laughs> Pioneer 4 is on the way to send a tiny speck of gold circling the sun, perhaps forever. Britain's Jodrell Bank radio telescope, the largest of its kind in the world, started tracking it within minutes of its launching. And it's the first to track a man-made object beyond the distance of the moon. It's a little card there, Brady, so that's for you. All right. It's a five-inch theodolite by Adams. It's a rather beautiful thing. It's kind of cute. It is cute, and it's by a really good instrument maker. George Adams' father and son were instrument makers to King George III, so this is a top-end instrument. 